Hello and welcome. I am Dr. Teresa DeSantis and I am going to talk about murder. Please take note that due to the nature and content of these videos, they are not recommended for anyone under the age of 18. Some of the content in this series may be disturbing and not suitable for some individuals over the age of 18. Discretion should be used when deciding to watch these videos. The Murder Mansion series is designed to profile serial killers and other types of murder. I have personal clinical experience in this area and for anyone who is interested in the clinical approach that I use or to learn more about profiling in general, please watch the Murder Mansion's introduction video. Here is the book that holds all of the killers in the series. Let's open it up and see who the mansion wants us to talk about today. Keith Hunter Jesperson, who is also known as the Happy Face Killer. Jesperson was initially convicted for three murders, but it has been confirmed that he killed eight women across the states of California, Florida, Nebraska, Oregon, Washington, and Wyoming. In his writings, Jesperson claims to have taken 185 victims. He is serving four consecutive life sentences at the Oregon State Penitentiary. That is because in December 2009, he was convicted of a murder in California, and in January 2010, he was given a fourth life sentence. Jesperson was born on April 6, 1955, to the marital union of Leslie and Gladys Jesperson in Chilliwack, British Columbia, Canada. He is the middle of five children with two brothers and two sisters. His father was a severe abusive alcoholic, and it is claimed that his grandfather was also a very violent person. The abuse that occurred within the Jesperson family was confirmed when author Jack Olson was investigating information to write a book. Jesperson's family treated him very poorly, and unlike his siblings, he received no attention from his parents. He was subject to beatings from his father with a leather belt, and sometimes these beatings happened in front of other people. There was one incident that is reported where his father used electric shock on Jesperson as a form of punishment. Jesperson could not even find peace in the relationships with his brothers, who because that Jesperson was an oversized child, they nicknamed him Igor or Ig. Besides being treated as an outcast by his own family, other children often made fun of him for his large size. Jesperson ended up having no other choice but being content playing by himself. By the age of five or six, he started to torture and kill small animals and enjoyed the adrenaline rush he felt when he took the life out of them. He also enjoyed watching animals kill each other. As Jesperson got older, he started to capture birds, stray cats, and stray dogs, and then strangle them to death. This was something that his father was actually proud of him for. And then, as he got older, he started having thoughts about what it would be like if he did the same type of acts to real people. Well, with those thoughts in mind, Jesperson tried to kill two of his peers. 
The first incident happened when he was 10 years old. He had a friend that he always got into trouble with. The problem was that the friend never took responsibility and would always blame Jesperson to get out of trouble. Meanwhile, it was then Jesperson who ended up getting severely punished many times for things that his friend did. So one day, Jesperson attacked his friend and started to violently beat him until Jesperson's father pulled him off the boy. Later, Jesperson stated that his real intent was to kill his friend. Another incident occurred when he was about 11 years old. He was swimming in a lake when a boy held him down under the water until he blacked out. Sometime later, when Jesperson was at a public pool, this boy was there and he tried to drown the boy by holding his head under the water and he wasn't going to stop until a lifeguard finally had to intervene. The Jesperson family moved from British Columbia to a trailer park in Selah, Washington. Jesperson remained a loner because of his overly large size. He claims to have been raped when he was 14 years old. However, details of why, who, or exactly what happened is unknown. He was not successful connecting with girls during high school. And because of this, he never attended a school dance or went to his senior prom. He did graduate high school in 1973 and wanted to go to college, but he did not because his father felt that he could never make it through college. After high school, Jesperson started a dating relationship with Rose Huck. In 1975, when Jesperson was 20 years old, they got married. The couple had three children, two girls and a boy. According to statements made by Ms. Huck, there were many good times for the children with their father. Jesperson overall was a good dad and he liked to spend time with his children. Within the marriage itself, it was a different story and it was not so good. This is because Jesperson was emotionally distant from Rose, but he was never abusive toward her. His oldest child, Melissa, has spoken out about what it is like to be the daughter of a serial killer. Her father hid his dark side from his children, but she does recall some memories of strange behavior. When she was six years old, she found kittens and showed them to her father. He proceeded to take the kittens and hang them by their tails off a clothesline. Melissa ran inside to get her mother, but when they went back outside, all of the kittens were laying on the ground dead. She also recalled being a teenager after her parents' divorce and her father making weird comments about his sexual acts with women. Also, one time while eating with her father in a diner, she recalls him telling her that he killed someone. Over the course of Jesperson's marriage, he worked as a long distance truck driver. His wife started to suspect that he was having affairs because he was so emotionally distant towards her. And she started to get phone calls from strange women who would call up and ask for him and identify themselves as his girlfriend. After 14 years of marriage, Rose had enough. While Jesperson was out on the road, she took the children and moved 200 miles away to her parents' residence in Spokane, Washington. The oldest child, Melissa, was 10 years old at that time. Jesperson would spend time with his children whenever his trucking job took him into the Spokane area. 
Jesperson, now being 35 years old, stood six feet, seven inches tall and weighed 240 pounds. He wanted to go back to a dream that he had as a child, which was to become part of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Department. He was accepted into the RMCP Training Academy, and during an exercise, he fell off a climbing rope and suffered an injury. The injury led to his dismissal from the Training Academy. Jesperson became very angry and he vowed to get back at society for their rules and not giving him a chance. He relocated to Cheney, Washington, where he resumed employment as an interstate truck driver. Jesperson's divorce from Rose was finalized in 1990. In that same year, on January 23rd, 1990, he killed his first victim. He met the victim at a bar near Portland, Oregon, and introduced himself. The victim was 23 years old and a very friendly, outgoing young woman who was seen by many as being slightly mentally slow. According to Jesperson's later confessions, he left the bar and came back later and saw the victim in the parking lot. He offered to buy her dinner and then purposely looked into his wallet as a ruse to show that he didn't have enough money. He used this to lure the victim back to his home that he was renting so that he could pick up more money and take her to dinner. The victim followed Jesperson into his residence. He mentioned to the victim that he wanted to have sex with her, but she rejected him. And when she did that, he struck her in the face. And then he started to relentlessly beat her in the face and the head. He grabbed her neck with one hand while he tied a rope around her neck with the other hand. He pulled the rope and watched the life slowly slip away from her. Once her body went limp, he let it drop to the floor and he went back to the bar to have a few more beers and talk to people in order to establish an alibi. Eventually, he went back to the house for the victim's body and her belongings to get rid of them. He drove up the scenic highway of the Columbia Gorge, where many times he had taken his children to spend time with them. When he found a deserted spot, he tossed her body over the side of the highway like it was a piece of garbage. Jesperson went to a truck stop where he sat and drank coffee for the remainder of the night as part of his alibi. Then he left he drove back down the scenic highway, and at one point, he picked up the victim's purse and threw it out of his car window. The victim's body was found several days later off the scenic highway by a college student that had pulled over to urinate. It was determined that she had been killed someplace else. She had been beaten, sexually assaulted, and strangled to death. There was also a ripped section of her jeans missing. On February 5th, the police received an anonymous phone call from a 57-year-old woman, Laverne Pavlinak. She stated that her boyfriend, John Sinowski, had committed the murder, and she heard him bragging about it to a friend that he had killed the girl. Sinowski voluntarily submitted to a polygraph exam, but he failed it. Later that month, when Laverne found out that there was not enough evidence to issue an arrest warrant for her boyfriend, she produced a piece of denim and said that she had found it on her boyfriend's uh, person. The forensic lab stated what she had presented to them when they compared it to the fabric of the jeans of the victim, it did not match. 
Laverne now went to desperate measures. She called the police and stated that she was an active participant in the murder. She said they had picked up the girl who was hitchhiking and they drove to the Vista house, which was about a mile away from where the victim's body was found. At the Vista house, Laverne said her boyfriend raped the victim and she strangled the victim while her boyfriend was beating her. Then they took the body and dumped it over the ravine. She took the police to the dump site and because she knew exactly where it was, the police felt that they had enough evidence and got an arrest warrant and picked up both Laverne and Sanowski. During Laverne's trial, she put a very strong case together. However, she did not realize that her making up all of this by details that she had heard through the media was going to get her a good 10 years or more in prison and that her boyfriend would possibly be facing the death penalty. When this reality set in, Laverne tried to say she made it all up. However, it was too late. Her taped confession played to the jury with too many details made the jury come back with a guilty verdict. Her boyfriend never went to trial and instead he pled guilty to a murder he did not commit to avoid being sentenced to death. While Laverne and Sanowski's trial was underway, graffiti was found at a truck stop in Montana that read, I killed Tanya Bennett, and two people are on trial for the killings. It was signed with the drawing of a happy face. Police dismissed this as a hoax, and the judge did not permit it to be submitted as evidence during Laverne's trial as proof of doubt that she may have made her story up. On March 25, 1991, Laverne started her 10-year prison sentence. Since Jesperson's graffiti did not get the attention he was hoping for, in March 1994, he wrote an anonymous letter and sent it to the Oregon courthouse. In the letter, he confessed to killing the first victim and signed it with the drawing of a happy face. A second letter was sent to the local newspaper and confessed to the first victim along with four other women that he murdered and exactly where those bodies could be found across several states. The letter was signed, The Happy Face Killer, with the drawing of a happy face next to it. At first, it was thought that the letters were a hoax, but the bodies were found in the exact location that was written in the letter. There were also details that were never released to the media about these victims that only the killer or investigators could have known. The letter appeared that the killer was bragging <clears throat> about what he had done and also to make fun of the police. On March 11, 1995, the body of a 41-year-old woman was found that had been thrown over the ravine on the side of the Columbia Gorge on the scenic highway very similar to the first victim. There was tape residue on her face as if tape were used to silence her. She had been raped and strangled to death. The victim was Jesperson's girlfriend. Her mother told police that her daughter had been dating a truck driver named Chris and that he had helped her to sell her car. The mother gave the police the bill of sale and it was co-signed by the name Keith Hunter Jesperson. Jesperson, being a long haul truck driver, was going to make it difficult for police to find and question him about his girlfriend's death. 
they were able to get information from Jesperson's employer, and the police traveled to New Mexico to meet up with him at his next stop. They took Jesperson to the local police station and took DNA samples from him. Jesperson said that the last time he saw his girlfriend was in an empty parking lot. They argued and they have not talked since. His behavior during the police interview was bizarre and he showed no emotion that his girlfriend had been murdered. The detective tried to build a rapport with Jesperson and at the end gave him his business card. It paid off because five days later, Jesperson called the detective and said that he had killed his girlfriend and wanted to turn himself in. He gave the detective a full confession over the phone that he killed his girlfriend by putting his fist down her throat. And then he put duct tape over her mouth because he wasn't sure if she was dead and he didn't want her to wake up and start bitching at him again. The night before Jesperson turned himself in, he wrote a letter to his brother. In the letter, he admitted to killing eight women. The police retrieved the letter and matched the handwriting to the letter that Jesperson had written to the local newspaper and the Oregon court. In the letter to his brother, Jesperson gave details about killing the first victim. He also gave the same confession to the police. The couple who had taken the blame for killing the first victim, were, they were innocent. Police had Jesperson take them to where he dumped the first victim, but the problem was where he took them was several hundred yards from where the body was actually found in comparison to when Laverne took them there and showed them the exact spot. But on the way back to the police station, Jesperson pointed out of the car window and said, that he had dumped the first victim's purse out the window right there. Police searched the area of five years of grown brush and they found nothing. They went back the next day and gave it one more shot and this time they found the victim's purse and her driver's license. In November 1995, the murder of the first victim was finally solved. Eventually, Laverne and her boyfriend were set free, but only after spending four years in prison. After killing the first victim in January 1990, Jesperson had waited 18 months before killing again in late July or early August 1992. One month later, he killed again. After Jesperson was in custody, he started to tell his attorney his innermost secrets. His attorney told him not to talk to anyone else, but Jesperson did not listen, and he confessed one of the murders to another inmate. He talked about a 21-year-old victim that he had picked up in January 1995 near Spokane, Washington. He agreed to drive her to his, her father's home in Colorado. When she called her father, he told her that he did not want to see her and to stay away. She then asked Jesperson to drop her off in Indiana so she could visit with a friend. He killed her in the state of Wyoming in a fit of rage because the victim would not let him sleep. He said, she kept bitching at me to keep driving in bad weather and I strangled her by putting my fist against her throat. Once she was dead, Jesperson went back to sleep. He woke up three hours later, drove to Nebraska, and bound the victim's body with black nylon rope. He tied the victim's body underneath his truck and then dragged her body along the pavement for about 10 to 12 
miles. When the body started to become loose, he stopped his truck, he detached the body and threw it into a ditch 75 feet off Interstate 80. Jesperson stated that he wanted to get caught so that he would not kill again. He said he had prayed to God for an answer and God told him to tell the truth. He said, quote, people say I am a monster, but I am not a monster. Just like the movie Jurassic Park, I was created by people, unquote. At one point, Jesperson stated that he was responsible for about 180 murders across the United States. He admitted to them to clear his conscience, but then recanted this admission. At one point, Jesperson was visited in prison by the Green River Killer Task Force to be questioned if he was responsible for any of the killings in their jurisdiction. Since many of the victims were prostitutes and strangled, it appeared that Jesperson may be responsible for some of the killings that they were trying to tie to the Green River Killer. Jesperson, in response, told them this. At 8 p.m., I drove up the Kutoma Seattle Strip instead of using the main highway. The strip is full of prostitutes and hitchhikers. I saw two cute ones as they talked together at a bus stop, but I only wanted one by herself. A quarter of a mile up the road, I saw a bitch walking fast with her hips swinging back and forth. She had nice long legs and her body was slender and firm. I approached her at 35 miles an hour and thought about her, but I knew I had to get my steel on first and the fun would come later. She reached the bus stop before me and stepped out into the road without looking. There was a car passing me on the left and I could only hope not to hit her by stepping on the brakes really hard. I heard the impact as her body struck my bumper and I felt her tumble under my tire. I got out of the truck and I saw that she was dead. I looked around for witnesses, but there were none. I felt that I could get away with it if I could get her body out of there. I dragged her out from under my truck and I put her body into the cab. I drove up the strip for about a half a mile and saw an open field with a lot of trees and enough brush to hide behind to dig her a shallow grave. I carried her over my shoulder and took my shovel. I tossed her body on the ground and removed all of her jewelry and put it in my pocket. As I was digging her grave, I heard something or someone coming toward me. I knelt down as to not be seen and I watched. And there was a man carrying a body, but his was inside a black plastic bag. And he proceeded to put the body down and dig a grave. I approached the man and startled him. But I said to him that I was amazed that the two of us had to get rid of two bodies at the same time. And now that I know what you have come out here for, I will get back to what I was doing. After we were both done, we stopped at a restaurant and had coffee together. I said to the man, I couldn't help but notice that yours and mine looked a lot alike. They have the same features, and the only difference is the necklace that I took off mine. I took the jewelry out of my pocket, and I put it on the table. The man picked it up. He studied it, and then a tear came to his eyes. I asked him, what's wrong? And he responded, we have more in common than burying bodies at the same time. We have both killed identical twins. 
there were no sisters killed with the Green River killings. So this story was a fabrication of Jesperson's imagination. In one of his essays called, I Am a Liar, it referred to this story. What was interesting is that many of Jesperson's murders paralleled those of the Green River murders. Perhaps because these killings were well known and he thought that this might be a way to get recognition for his murders. He desperately wanted to be recognized by someone and is being seen by doing this, sending taunting letters to the court and the local paper. Let's examine his dynamics. From Jesperson's earliest memories, he felt completely rejected by his parents and siblings. He was an outcast and he was made fun of because of his large stature. He was abused by his father and he could not get positive attention from his father until his father gave approval and he expressed being proud of Jesperson for killing animals. This is more than likely why this behavior became second nature to him and any time he killed an animal, it made him feel good about himself because he knew his father would be proud of him. It can be speculated that since he did not get attention from his parents and he was treated as an outcast, that he received no love or nurturing from his mother. This comes out later in life when he is married and he cannot emotionally connect with his wife. His mother's emotional rejection and the total lack of nurturing from her never afforded Jesperson to learn how to have a meaningful attachment with a woman. This stands to reason why his marriage was filled with that emotional distance. Yet, Jesperson had to feel something for his wife because she denied that there was any type of abuse. It also shows that although he turned into a killer, he had the ability to feel towards someone. This is also shown again with his children, who he appeared to love and care about. Although he had a dark side who was killing women, he was a different person with his children. And for the most part, he was able to suppress the monster that was growing inside of him around them. There were slip-ups where he could not suppress it. For example, killing the kittens when his oldest child was only six years old and it traumatized her. In Jesperson's mind, he was a father and doing the one thing his father was proud of him for, and that was being able to kill animals. I do not think he meant to kill the kittens to traumatize his daughter at all. It was done to act the way he thought a father should act, as twisted as that sounds. Jesperson coming home from a road trip and finding his wife and children gone was a major, major blow for him. The four people he was able to feel anything for and some type of attachment had now deserted him. He was alone again, like he had been all the time until he started dating Rose. There was nothing left but the reinforcement that he was not good enough for anyone. Jesperson tried to pick up the pieces by heading back to Canada to become part of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. He makes it into the academy and more than likely, this gave him a major boost in his self-esteem. He was finally going to be someone other than a truck driver and become part of a brotherhood where people cared about and looked after one another. But then he sustains an injury and gets dismissed because of it. 
This is another major rejection and a dream of his that just falls apart because he is not good enough to fit in anywhere. Jesperson goes back to Washington, but there's nothing there for him anymore. It is a reminder that his family is gone and he feels nothing but rejection, emptiness, and as an outcast. He kills his first victim two months before his divorce is finalized. Jesperson meets a, a friendly, nice looking woman at a bar and she becomes intoxicated, but given what is written about the victim, she was probably overly friendly toward him. It is believed that he used not having money to get her to come home with him. But at that point, I am still not sure that there was an actual intent to kill her. I think that once she denied his request for sex, all of the rejection and feeling something was wrong with him was sitting there and his entire life came up to the surface and here comes the monster inside of him. The rage surfaces and he starts beating her and then strangles her to death. The method of strangulation also makes sense in this case. The victims cannot yell, they cannot scream, and it silences them. There is no chance that Jesperson will be berated or put down by them in any way. There is the satisfaction that he receives by seeing the life drained out of the victim, just like he did to the animals many times. It gives him a sense of feeling power and control for the first time in his life. Rather than others taking control over his emotions, he takes the ultimate control back from them, their lives. Jesperson's victim choice were all women, and women he had easy access to being a truck driver. Mom, who should have protected him, girls he could not connect with while growing up, and ultimately a wife who had no use for him anymore, as well as no children to come home to, were all contributing factors to the buildup of rage towards women. One of the things about Jesperson is that there is a part of him that was not a killer, a part of him that tried to be a decent father and create memories with his children unlike his parents had done with him. That part of him that could feel for others was a major conflict for him. With the killing of his girlfriend, there is probably truth when he says that they argued right before her death. He had gotten used to killing by this point, and the rage that he experienced was never suppressed deep enough anymore. Within that argument, it stands to reason that the girlfriend pulled the trigger somehow by things that were said or something she wanted to do that was going to make him feel very rejected and pushed aside. One thing that has to be noted is Jesperson wanted for once to be recognized in any which way. He couldn't stand that two people took credit for that killing. This was the ultimate thing that made him feel even more invisible. He starts with letters to get noticed and his arrest to become even more recognized. Now he is written about and people will always know him as the happy face killer. I hope you found this chapter of the Murder Mansion enjoyable and informative. If you liked the episode, please click the like button below and subscribe to our channel. We are also on Facebook and Instagram if you want to stop by and follow us on there. If you have any suggestions for a killer that you would like to see 
or if you have any other suggestions for topics or a different type of series, please email us at support at firstlightpsych.com. Hope to see you next week in the mansion for the next killer.